Hello, everybody. Uh, we're going to start, and so please uh, continue to uh, those of you in line to uh, be in line and get your food. But we are going to start because uh, we're going to have to stop, I think, promptly at one. Uh, I'm just so pleased that we're able to uh, have uh, this event, uh, one in a series, looking at criminal justice and criminal justice reforms in light of not just the recent events, uh, Ferguson, Staten Island, and so forth, but frankly, for as many people on this panel know uh, from firsthand experience, issues that have gone on for decades. Um, uh, and so I thought that one, one thing that we have not had sufficient time to talk about here, and I really want to see if we can make some progress is to talk about concrete reforms. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, our panelists and then ask each one, put them on the spot, what is a concrete reform that you think could be adopted and could make a difference? And maybe I'll, I'll even soft pedal the first one, could be adopted, but make a real difference on the issues of racial justice, racial inju injustice, and making sure that the policing and law enforcement processes in this country serve everybody in the country. So that's the concrete question. We have a, a terrific group of people here, uh, and we'll go in the order uh, in which they're sitting. Uh, we have right here Professor Andrew Crespo, uh, who comes to us recently from his service at the uh, amazing and wonderful Public Defender Service in Washington, D.C., which you'll see is well represented on this panel. Um, uh, and uh, Professor Crespo uh, has just started here as, a, uh, as an assistant professor, um, and we're so pleased that he's returned to his home at, at Harvard and Harvard Law School, uh, where he was a distinguished student. Um, next, uh, we have Charles Ogletree, who uh, also uh, was a major figure at that same office in Washington, D.C., um, but has, uh, I think, since that time, clearly assumed uh, a position as a leader uh, in the whole country when it comes to criminal justice and when it comes to racial justice. Uh, next, we have Paul Evans. Uh, Paul, uh, we are so, so delighted that uh, Paul Evans was able to join us. He served as commissioner of the Boston Police Department uh, between 1994 and 2003, uh, widely uh, uh, praised and understood for his uh, emphasis on community policing and development of community patrols. Uh, he then went to uh, become a director um, uh, of the Police Standards Unit of Britain's Home Office, and so he has a cross-cultural comparison here, which I think will be very, very helpful. Uh, and so, Paul, thank you so much for being here and for making our panel not just uh, alums of the uh, the Public Defender Service. Carol Steiker, uh, Professor uh, Steiker uh, is one of the country's leading experts uh, uh, in, in many areas of criminal law and she runs uh, the criminal uh, law workshop here uh, as well as uh, being be a beloved teacher of criminal law and uh, is an alum of that same office. Uh, Ron Sullivan, uh, Professor Sullivan, uh, who also worked at that same office uh, <laughs> as the director of that office uh, and as an initiator of many great training programs in that office that produce so many great people, uh, runs our Criminal Justice Institute here and also has among his many, many uh, current activities, uh, he's been called in to review the practices, is it Brooklyn? Brooklyn, Brooklyn the Brooklyn uh, uh, law enforcement practices. Uh, and so he's involved in law reform right now. So uh, let's start with Andrew. Thank you so much, Dean Minow, uh, for bringing us all together. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I'm going to focus my, uh, my comments and my reform proposal on policing, uh, not because I think that policing is necessarily the biggest problem in our criminal justice system. I actually don't think it's the biggest problem in our criminal justice system. I think that mass incarceration and uh, racial disparities in the system are, are an enormous problem. Um, but I think that policing is also a very important issue, and it's the issue that is the front and center of our national discussion right now. And we have the police commissioner here with us, so I thought it would be valuable when talking about concrete reforms to focus my um, contribution, at least, on policing. Um, and in thinking through concrete reforms, I thought it would be helpful to start at least just identifying for me what I think of as the root problem. Uh, one, uh, the root problem as I see it is fundamentally a, a democratic problem, that we seem to have gotten a disconnection uh, between the way that policing operates in some of our major urban cities uh, and the community being policed. Uh, 
a mentality that has appeared to develop, and I want to stress that I don't think that this is a mentality that is shared by all police officers, or that police officers are uh, fundamentally flawed or bad in how they're approaching their work. I think this is a systemic issue, but that there is a, a cultural problem of an us versus them mentality, at least in urban policing, uh, and that we've gotten to a place where it seems that um, the people, with a capital P, who live in the community being policed are not necessarily uh, thought of as the people who are in control of the police as, a, as an institution of our government. Uh, I think that one of the major problems in how we try to conceptualize and execute oversight of the police is that we focus almost exclusively on individual, after the fact, accountability suppression hearings, internal affairs, uh, complaint boards, civil lawsuits, very rarely criminal prosecutions, uh, as opposed to structural ex ante type ways of redesigning some of these institutions. So one of my uh, proposals is to try to work on that democratic accountability problem uh, by thinking differently about the way that we regulate the police. Uh, and to start that by exposing what I would call the secret law of police governance. Uh, big p urban police departments, my understanding is, uh, have actually pretty detailed internal rules or orders. Uh, my, my experience obviously is with the DC police system. They have hundreds and hundreds of pages of what are, of what are called general orders. And if you read these as law students, you will see that they look very much like a statute or a regulation. They have a definition section. They have multiple subparts. You can get to part you know, 4A, small i, and then it keeps going in these police regulations. And they cover an enormous part of the waterfront of policing, from whether property should be seized to whether a warrant should be requested, how it should be executed, what civilian interaction should be like. They, they cover policing. Uh, as a practice. Uh, what is startling to me uh, is that this is in many ways secret law. Uh, you can go, for example, to the Washington Metropolitan Police Department's website and see a small percentage of these regulations published. The largest collection of them I've ever seen is actually on a computer server at the office you heard so much about, the Public Defender's Office, uh, because they're just saved and archived when they come up in litigation. But the, the public does not actually have a way of interacting with this, this body of law that, in my experience, police officers actually treat as important law, as meaningful law for their behavior. The officers who I encountered in, in my work internalized these rules and seem to think of them as, in many ways, the most important sort of um, set of norms that was governing their behavior, the most immediate, the most proximate, and the ones that uh, they seemed to care about the most. But the policy decisions that went into making the substance of that wasn't ever part of any sort of democratic discussion. So one reform would be, first off, sunshine, right? Ex make, this, make a requirement that these things are public, but not just public, that they are subject to some sort of democratic um, either uh, process. Treat them like, like regular law in that you could have your local city council actually go through these systematically and decide after some debate with a room full of people, you know, your council sitting up on a table like this one and a room full of people who care about this in the audience like we do for other types of local law, uh, have them debated and then either modified or ratified by your local <coughs> government. Or at a minimum, you could have the police do something like notice and comment or uh, an opportunity to uh, have input from a broader array of um, perspectives than just the police themselves writing these rules and keeping them internal uh, where there's no opportunity for a discussion about what those policies actually are. Thank you. Charles Ogletree. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and um, I'm not happy to be the oldest uh, member of the Public Defender <laughs> Service, uh, but I'm glad to see that folks uh, from Washington uh, are here uh, and, and see the uh, importance of academic career. I'm going to say a little bit about police, and I'm going to say a lot more about uh, specific communities and what the communities need to do. Um, I, when I went to law school here, I was thinking about the first job, working at law firms, uh, or working at the Public Defender Service, and 
I had a long conversation with my mother and told her, I said, I'm not coming back to California. She said, okay, that's fine, Junior. So I'm going to uh, probably uh, practice in Washington, D.C. That's great. What firm? I said, well, I'm going to be with the Public Defender Service. She said, oh, that's great. I'm glad because the public finally needs somebody to represent them against all these criminals in the world, right? <laughs> she had no idea that's what we did, right? Uh, and I wasn't going to tell her. Uh, <laughs> But I think it was very important to understand that. And my best friends, I say this very seriously, my best friends were plea leaks, right? Because I understood how they worked, where they worked, where they lived. I knew how difficult their jobs were. My sister uh, was a police officer in the sheriff's department uh, in California. And so I had this sense about them, and that made a, a big difference. Uh, and that made it much easier for my job uh, as a public defender. Uh, we, before uh, Andrew and, some, and I think Ron was uh, at the public defense, so I'm not sure if Carol was there or not, but our offices were right across from the police department, right? Uh, and what was amazing, I always worked Monday through Sunday, uh, every day, right? And my investigators would come to my office and meet with me on Saturday. And what would we do? We would see who would be driving up to see the police on Saturday. Uh, and then we would uh, have our car follow this person back to their home in some place in Washington or Maryland or Virginia, and we'd get a statement. Why were we able to do that? Well, because, and, and maybe it's changed, but the police only would see victims, alleged victims, uh, once. That is, the date of the incident or right after the incident when somebody was killed, robbed, uh, or injured, uh, and then see them at trial. And so they uh, would open the doors and talk to us, and that made a big difference for what we were doing in Washington, and that's made a big difference for the students who are in court uh, here in, in Boston. So it, it helped to understand what that meant to be able to interview people. Uh, my sense is that I, I, even though there's a focus on police departments, I've talked to a lot of chiefs and talked about reforms and things like that and diversity and how important that is. But the real thing is, where, where is the community? And I'm looking at the community. We have a lot of communities listed, but looking at Ferguson, it just amazes me uh, that it's uh, almost 70% African American. Uh, they have very few people on the city council, very few people on the police force, very few people running the city. Uh, and they're charged with most of the crimes in Ferguson. And my sense is to the people of Ferguson and St. Louis, turn things around. You have to be in charge. You have to make things happen. You have to run for office. You have to vote. One out of five people uh, in Ferguson voted uh, in the uh, recent election. So that, to me, is the groundwork. It's not criticizing police. It's trying to figure out what can we do as a community that makes a big difference. And, and that's what I've been trying to do uh, the many years. Uh, and uh, you'll hear from Police Evans and his brother uh, that you know my, my relationship with police, the first thing I always ask, uh, can I do a ride along? Uh, can I go and visit uh, uh, the stations? And every student should do that. Every person should do that because it's open uh, and that you should have a sense of that. And, and I don't have a sense, uh, I don't have a view whether students are uh, defenders or prosecutors, whether they're police, uh, whether they're going to pursue business or law, it, it doesn't matter to me. Whatever you want to do, it makes a big difference. But just be concerned about justice and equality that makes a big difference. Final thing, I'll say this. I thought, uh, looking at the, and I was born in, in the 60s and the 70s and 80s, that we were through with all the issues. Everything was changed. The law was changed. We didn't have segregation. We had opportunities to participate. Uh, and now, 2014 and 15 reminds me of what we already went through. We're, we're having uh, a sense of the same thing happening again. Poor communities, people can't find jobs, people are not getting an education, people are not uh, uh, taking care of their families uh, the way that they should, uh, and there the, are a lot of recidivism in the criminal justice system. So I'm hoping uh, that the focus will be on, our focus will be not just on making the police a better department, and I think that's important, but also making people better people to take care of themselves uh, so that we don't see the separation that has been a big problem in America. And I hope that we can be uh, the place that most countries around the world will look there is a place that really concerns, <laughs> that's concerned about justice and equality, everybody's included. And so that's what uh, I hope will happen going forward. Commissioner? Thank you. Commissioner? It's a pleasure to be here. Um, just some concrete things. Um, <coughs> I joined the uh, police department in uh, December of 1970. 
I was one of 66 white males who went into a department that was probably close to 98, 99% uh, white, okay? Um, the department today is probably closer to 35 to 40% minority women and, and what have you. Department changed dramatically. Uh, that was a direct result of federal intervention. The department in the late 1970s um, entered into a consent decree which required the department to hire for one ap white applicant, we had to hire a minority applicant. Now, we are a better police department now because we represent the community we serve. Uh, there is diversity and initially in those first days when we were hiring off hiring minority officers, very difficult to get people that wanted to come onto a police department where the community fire is an occupying force. Mm. Now you look back almost 30 years later, second and gen third generation minority officers' children coming on the department. No shortage uh, of applicants uh, from, from the minority community. But yet, if you continue to look at the classes, we, we struggle to get the type of minority representation, representation we need. And a lot of that has to go with what are the civil service rules, okay? It's, it's disabled veterans get preference, veterans get preference, it's all about who gets the highest marks. So when you're looking to get a class, you just can't pick, you have to go off a list. And, and sometimes that list handcuffs. Now that, that consent decree, was in place for probably you know, 15, 20 years, it's not in place now. And, and how do you continue to maintain that? Now some of the things we did over the years is do special certifications. We need officers who speak Spanish, French Creole, um, Chinese, Mandarin, you, you name it, to try to represent it. But increasingly it, be, it becomes difficult in, in maintaining and in making sure that the system, the civil service system allows you to do that, I think, is important. And increasingly, not just in the big cities, but also in other communities. Um, if, if there's one buzzword, I think, in policing, it's accountability. Um, there has to be accountability in police agencies. Now, as far as the use of deadly force, you know, as long as I've been a police officer, when an officer used deadly force, you can count the next day's newspaper, front page above the fold, and probably stays there for three or four years. Community, what's going on? What do we have to do? So there are, always has been oversight and concern both from the media, media and the community about the police use of deadly force in the police department. And that is as it should be. The police are given no greater power than to use deadly force. And there should be all kinds of oversight. And we've had a lot of that oversight. But I think that oversight contributes to the culture of organizations. You know, you look at some of, you know, the East Coast departments, I'll say Boston, New York, you look at the amount of offices, the population it serves, the use of deadly force is relatively small. Now the pre professor, uh, I, I think, mentioned he was from DC. I don't know if he remembers, but Back around 2000 or so, the Washington Post did a large expose on the Washington, D.C. Police Department, their use of deadly force, compared it to other departments, and it, we were at the lowest, but their numbers were way out of whack. Nobody was paying attention. Now, if you look at that piece and then go back to what is happening now, I bet you it's, it's dramatically different. The leadership, there's no bigger catalyst for unrest between the police and community than the use of deadly force, okay? So if a, if a police leader wants good community relations, good community policing, he needs to take care of that. The, the other thing I'll talk about is the, the accountability, it, it's, it's data analysis. If, if policing has been successful reducing crime, Bill Bratton started it in New York, this whole uh, Comstat, what does the data say? Where is the crime? Where do we need to be? And, and, and what do we need to be doing about it? Now, when you look at issues of deadly force, you know, the more information you can get about that, the better. Um, analyze, analyze the data. 
Back around maybe 2001, I was looking at data around how, many, how much deadly force I had. What were the circumstances? What were the conditions? Um, I, I had an inordinate number of people that were firing at vehicles. And I, I had a young lady killed, and I said, no more. We're going to stop firing at vehicles. Um, and, you know, that type of data analysis of what's going on and what do we have to change, where do we have to change policy, where do we have to do better training, uh, training, policies, decision making are all absolutely critical. But that whole, you know, data analysis. And the other thing is we, we hire people. Hopefully we do a better job uh, of, you know, getting the right people into our organizations. But once they're in their organizations, we have to continue to hold them account in the same manner that we do for crime analysis meetings. When we were doing crime analysis meetings, crime was going dramatically down. So I started saying, we're going to do personnel analysis meetings. We're going to look at our people. We're going to sit down with my command staff. I'm going to go into each police district. I'm going to sit with their supervisors, and I'm going to go through every officer in that district. And we're going to talk about how they use their sick time, how they use injured time, how many IAD complaints they got, how many use of force complaints they got, how many motor vehicle accidents they're in, what type of arrests they're making. Are they making an inordinate number of arrests around disorderly person A and B? But that constant analysis, holding your officers to account, holding your supervisors account. If this, you know, one of the things we said for years about um, our defendants is we've got a disproportionate amount of people out there that are committing crime. When police forces look at it, when I do these personnel analysis meetings, I get the same thing. I get a disproportionate amount of officers that are at the top of some of those categories. IED complaints, use of force reports, and it's my responsibility as a commissioner to make sure that I identify those people and train them. So that whole accountability, embedding systems, looking at where are things happening, what has to be done differently, You've got more than 17,000 police departments, and you probably have as many as 17,000 policies uh, across the U.S. When I was in the U.K., they had 43 police forces, and, and you know all the all the policies for all of them emanated right from the U.K. Now that system won't happen, but you know there are accredited accreditations of police forces, and there are good policies, and in, in those as best they can should be implemented. Thank you. Can I just ask what's an I IED? IED is Internal Affairs Division. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Professor Steiker. Thank you, Dean Minow. Thank you all for being here. I'd like to follow up uh, the Commissioner's comments, which I thought were excellent, on accountability with some thoughts about criminal justice accountability for police use of deadly force. Because after all the events in Ferguson and Staten Island, um, were in response to grand jury's failure to indict the police who used deadly force in those cases. So internal accountability within police departments, huge. But also criminal justice accountability for police officers who use deadly force and kill people um, is really important because, especially because the police are holding others to account in the criminal justice system. And there's a lot of very interesting work about how law enforcement and law abidingness is produced by people's belief in the legitimacy of the criminal justice system of the law of, of law of the law that regulates their communities and nothing breeds lack of legitimacy when the same system that regularly holds members of the community criminally responsible for their conduct appear to evade criminal responsibility for their own conduct now, this connects to another point the commissioner made, which is the, something that's unusual um, in Western democracies is the incredible local, uh, local control of criminal justice institutions. Boston has a police department. Cambridge has a police department. Springfield has a police department. Criminal justice is run on a local basis. Similarly, prosecutorial offices are local. They're countywide, Middlesex, Norfolk, Suffolk County locally elected police departments, not like the UK. We don't have a top-down national 
police department, and we don't have a top-down national prosecution. As a consequence of this, local prosecutors and local police officers are ve work very closely together as a relatively small and local unit. Prosecutors absolutely must maintain good relationships with the police officers with whom they work to investigate crimes and prosecute them. Therefore, when there's a potential criminal case against a police officer in the very same department that the prosecution must work <coughs> regularly with, it creates a difficult conflict of interest. Now, many urban prosecutors' offices create special units within their prosecutorial offices to deal with uh, criminal complaints against police officers. But here's my suggestion. I maintain that's not sufficient um, independence in terms of the investigation of especially the use of lethal force by police officers. One solution would be to have an independent prosecutor, a prosecutor outside of the local prosecution office that works hand in glove with the police department every day, investigate those particular cases and perhaps set up a special grand jury, not the grand jury that the, the county prosecutors work with every day to investigate and decide on charges um, uh, in such cases. In fact, in the wake of Eric Garner's death on Staten Island, the New York Attorney General suggested that his office, his statewide office, um, based in Albany, not in Staten Island, not in New York City, be the investigating office for lethal force used by police officers. I think this is an excellent idea, whether it's a statewide attorney general or simply whether it's an independent prosecutor appointed but from outside of the prosecutorial <coughs> office that works hand in glove with the local police department. I think this would assure the independence of these investigations, the independence of the grand jury's decision in such cases, and this would promote uh, the legitimacy of the criminal justice system in the eyes of the community who have every reason to expect such independence when <coughs> these very important and disturbing events take place. Thank you. <coughs> Professor Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Dean Minow. So let me start with a, a general uh, observation. Um, I, I think that we can approach this question uh, how do we make our system of policing better uh, by looking at uh, three registers or looking at the question along uh, three registers? The first is uh, legal reform. Uh, what can you do about the laws? Uh, how can you change laws in a way that incentivizes good behavior and disincentivizes uh, bad behavior? So something like what Professor Steiker just uh, suggested, uh, uh, a law that says that uh, Police-involved shootings have to be investigated and potentially prosecuted by a special counsel or, or independent counsel. So that's that's one register. The second register is uh, uh, civic engagement. Uh, Professor Crespo touched on that a bit in his remarks. Uh, I was shocked. I've been obviously speaking about this a lot uh, over these last couple months. I was shocked at uh, how many people in audiences, obviously not like this, not law students, but, but had no idea that a prosecutor could uh, bring a case before uh, a grand jury a second time or a third time. I mean, there are some constraints, but people say, oh, I thought, it was, I thought it was done, right? I thought it was finished. I thought it was over, right? So we might think of civic engagement along the lines of uh, teaching people about what their, uh, how their democracy works. And I mean, I could foresee uh, a prosecutor running in some jurisdiction, say Ferguson, uh, on the platform that if elected, I'm going to do this thing correctly. I'm going to actually present a competent case uh, before the grand jury and have people vote you know, up, up or down. Uh, the third is, um, is policing reform, the third register of policing reform. And this will be my uh, concrete suggestion. Uh, so I'm, I'm working on a, a, a large document with two other law professors about policing reform. And we're taking this approach that I just outlined along these three registers. And here's one of the more uh, controversial ones. Uh, and I'm 
admittedly a bit ambivalent about it, but I'm, I'm going to throw it out and, and see uh, what people think. Um, so uh, here it is. So again, this notion of incentivizing good behavior and disincentivizing bad behavior. So um, I had a friend who used to say one way to, to incentivize uh, behavior is just to keep adding zeros. Keep adding zeros. So this is in the context of a, a, a civil suit. Uh, so we thought, well, in what way might uh, a, a police officer feel personally, fiscally responsible for bad behavior? Well, here's an idea uh, that uh, police departments uh, would have to uh, buy some form of liability insurance. Uh, that is, if an officer in a particular department is found uh, liable for excessive force, then you know the insurance would, would, would pay out whatever the proceeds are. But here's the thing, that the officer be personally responsible for any increase in uh, liability insurance as a function of that uh, officer's uh, misbehavior. Um, so that's, that's one level. The second level is that the department uh, itself would have to bear uh, some cost if an officer is found uh, liable for excessive force. And this would get at the, uh, the cultural problem that Professor Crespo spoke about. That is, now you have, uh, there would be a self-interest for police officers not to have money come out of their, their pockets, uh, but also there would be a departmental interest in constraining the uh, activity of police officers in a, in, in a particular sort of way, in a rational sort of way. So you have these uh, dual interests at stake. Now, the pushback is, when I've run this by police officers, is they say, well, there, then there'll just be a massive slowdown. They won't do anything. They'll say, money out of my pocket, I'm not risking it and then everybody is going to be um, in danger because police officers are going to do a slowdown like what we saw in New York um, a few weeks ago. Um, so um, that's a whole other story if, you know, we're only going to arrest people when absolutely necessary. So what are these other arrests for? What were they for anyway? I never quite <laughs> understood that. Um, so, uh, but um, I certainly understand that uh, critique, uh, but I think the benefits of what I'm suggesting would outweigh the, the cost. What a disciplined panel. This is so good. I'm going to invite people to come up and, and uh, for questions and uh, comments. Uh, there are a lot of people here, so um, I'm going to ask you to keep them brief. But while I do uh, this, I'm going to ask just Commissioner Evans a, a follow-up question. Uh, you, you said uh, the important uh, task uh, is to take care of misuse of deadly force. And I wonder what does that mean in the era of the increasing militarization of the police? Um, you know, the, the, the sale of just remarkable military type equipment, uh, the studies that show that young police officers that have been trained with this uh, much more elaborate equipment are much more likely to use it higher use of uh, tasers by young police officers compared with older police officers and, and down the line. So what does it mean to take care of it uh, in this era of a highly militarized police? Yeah, I, I think that's, again, I, a, a lot of it is it, it's police departments are on uh, very limited budgets, okay? Almost 80 to 90% of their budgets go. So when somebody's given out free equipment, they'll stand in line whether they need it or not. Your SWAT teams, Prob probably need that. Um, you know, I can remember after 9-11, um, you know, we, we talked about, do we do a show of force similar to what happened in New York? And the then Mayor Menino said, absolutely not. We're not going to have officers out there with rifles and machine guns. Now, that changed a little bit after the marathon bombing and what have you. But I, I think his concern, and I think the police concern has to be, is the community. We don't want to be an intimidating force, but there are going to be occasions, tactical occasions, where you're going to bring that out. But uh, you know, it's it, it's not something that you want to, on a day-to-day -day basis out on the street. Thank you, Aaron. Um, Anybody say who you are? Well, I'm Aaron Bray. I'm a two L here, um, and I have a very direct question for Professor Sullivan. But I want to preface my comments by by acknowledging the fact that. I've been very critical of the HLS faculty um, for what I perceive to be a lack of community engagement. While I feel like a lot of you all are all too willing to sit in this ivory tower, pontificate 
about the solutions and initiatives that need to be implemented, I very rarely see you guys engage with the direct victims of this theoretical problem we're talking about, because for a lot of us, it's not theoretical. Um, so having said that, I want to take this time to publicly acknowledge Professor Sullivan for taking that step and going beyond this Harvard bubble. Um, over J term, there was a town hall meeting held at Roxbury Community College, and Professor Sullivan was on that panel, and he spoke power to truth, similar to the way he did today. And I just want to take the, this moment right now to acknowledge you for that and to just kind of report back, because I can't tell you how many people I spoke to personally that appreciated your presence on that panel. You brought so much justification and validation to a lot of the firmly held grievances we have in our community with our police force. So I want to thank you for that. That being said, I want to take it a step further and ask you. With that being said, I want to pose a challenge to you. Um, I want to know if you're willing to go beyond words and put some action behind your words. So what do I mean by that? The community has collectively gotten together and drafted a letter to the DOJ to try to launch an investigation into the BPD for a number of grievances, one of which has been the use of deadly force, because if you look on average, dating back to 1988, we've had on average one homicide committed by them a year since then, so we want them to look into that. We want them to look into the gross instances of corruption within their ranks, and obviously we want them to look into the stop and frisk issues, just to name a few. So, as I said, the letter's been drafted. I would like to know if you'd be willing to put your signature on that letter. Well, <laughs> I, uh, I think he's got to read the letter. I, 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 to, and I know you're a lawyer, you know what I'm saying? I understand you're not going to John Hancock on anything you haven't read, so obviously that's assumed, but are you willing to consider it? Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Say who you are. Hi, uh, my name is Catherine Waleka. I'm a 3L. Next year, I will be working in the appeals uh, unit in Philadelphia, working for the district attorney there. Um, I wanted to thank you all for being here, and I had a few questions for uh, Commissioner Evans. Uh, my first question was, you had talked about the importance of personnel review, and I understand, I don't know how accurate this report was, but I understand that in the, in the Tamir Rice case, the officer who shot the young boy, I think he was 12 years old, had actually received negative evaluations before from pre previous units, not in his final assignment in Cleveland, but in others, saying that he had, quote, uh, poor judgment and should be assigned to desk duty, that he was um, that he was likely to shoot unnecessarily. So I was wondering first what you thought about that, and then my second question was, what is the BPD's approach to the failure of police to appear for trials? Um, because I've seen in the courts where I practice that we've had to dismiss for want of prosecution when police officers don't show up, and that's deeply disappointing to us. Um, on, the, on the Cleveland case, I, I, I mean, when I was the commissioner, uh, I did not do my, the candidates to be hired by the police department were done by a, what they called a re recruit investigation unit. Okay, I, I took it away from the recruit in investigation unit and gave it to my internal affairs unit. In essence, I did not want individuals coming in with problems to become bad cops. So I put the people who investigated up front to make sure we didn't do it. Now, now again, we deal with the civil service system. I may say I don't want you, but I've got to have good cause or our civil service is going to say he get, he, that person gets hired. So not knowing what the hiring system is in, um, in Cleveland, I, I, I couldn't tell you. But bottom line is if, if, we, if we found that there were backgrounds like that, um, that type of report from another department, we wouldn't hire that person. Okay. And, you know, if there's a lot of, say, motor vehicle violence, domestic violence, any of that type of things, they're, they're not, they're arrested for those. They're not even considered in, in this day and age. So there is scrutiny, uh, intense scrutiny before they become police, but we're not the final arbiter. If they appeal our decisions and we bypass them on the civil service list, they can become police officers. So. Uh, again, and there's, there, you know, once they come, they're, they're probationary officers for uh, 13 months. Any time during those 13 months, 
they can be terminated for the slightest reason, so you've got a good chance to monitor to see what they're doing. But after that, they become you know, members of the union, and it's incredibly difficult um, to, to dismiss officers uh, for anything but egregious misconduct. And the second question was about uh, officers not showing up yeah. at hearings. Yeah, that, that, you know, that's, in the old days, officers used to make an arrest and be in the court the next day. Okay, part of the problem is the notification system, when they're needed, when they're not. It's been a problem for as long as you can remember. You, officers make an awful lot of money going to court. When is the case going? When doesn't it go? The Globe Spotlight team did an extensive look at officers not showing up for court probably back in the early 2000s. It, it continues to be a problem of, of making sure you have a notification system. Where we know the officer, or not we, but where the department knew that the officer was properly notified and they didn't show up their, their uh, discipline. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Sam, I'm a 2L. Um, I think uh, we've heard some really great suggestions about accountability and legitimacy. Um, it seems like there's been a major problem, a major rift between law enforcement and the communities that they serve. Do any of you have any suggestions or know of any initiatives that can kind of fix that problem, which seems to be at the heart of some of these issues? So who would like that? Sully? Yeah. I mean, w one thing that, I mean, this is nothing new or original, but one, one thing that people talk about a lot is the notion of community policing. And if you drill down with that, you know, so it's not just a, a label, it's the notion of uh, police officers being involved in a community, knowing a community, uh, so that they exercise discretion responsibly. So um, uh, all of our dear departed friend, you know, Bill Stunts would, would say, you know, uh, what, what's, the, what's, the, uh, what's the speed limit on I-90? You know, it's well to whatever the state trooper sets the, the gun at. The, uh, the radar gun at. It's a, it's a huge degree of d discretion on the street and on the street encounters. And do, the ex do, do police exercise the discretion the way HUPD does? You know, underage alcohol, pour it out, go home, don't do it again, or handcuffs. Uh, you know, my, my son's school, if they get into a, some boys get into a scuffle, they get a firm talking to by the uh, administrator. You know, a couple miles west you know, they're in handcuffs, right? How, how do we get them to exercise discretion in a more rational way? So um, a lot comes under this rubric community policing, but um, you have to sort, I think we have to be, right now color is a proxy for criminality in, in, in so many ways, right? Uh, you know, the way Professor Ogletree is dressed right now, you know, I, don't, don't go too far, Tree. Uh, you know, right? Uh, you know, he, he, he might get stopped, right? Um, it, um, and I'm very, very, being very, very serious, right? Uh, so, you know, but if you're in a community, you know people, um, you can begin to exercise discretion in a more meaningful and fair and equitable way. Sam's, Sam's question sort of prompts a question for me that I wanted to ask the commissioner to help just our understanding a little bit. You know, I, I grew up uh, about an hour north of New York City and a large number of people in my community were police officers for New York City. Hour and a half drive to get to the city that was being policed. Um, and you can contrast that to DC where at least the judges and I think some of the prosecutors have residency requirements where you, you have to live uh, where you are enforcing the criminal law. Do you have a sense in big cities how many people are living in the communities that they're policing and whether it would be practical to have residency requirements that you live in the precinct or at least the territorial jurisdiction? Yeah, Boston had a residency law. Before you take the test to be a police officer, you had to live in the city for a year. Okay, for the longest time, I, I forget when that law would have, it maybe would have been the late 80s, had to remain a resident, okay? Um, and in essence, I think there was real value to that. Uh, when I was in the 70s, cops would roll up to a call and say, you know, what are you living here for? Move out to the suburbs, because they lived in the suburbs. And I think officers had a more vested interest in the communities they serve when they live in those communities. But uh, Boston required that for an awful long time. Um, it had to be, I'd say, late 2000s, where they allowed officers to move out of the city, but they could only do that after 10 years. Um, 
And, and it was, I think, just a matter of collective bargaining. The city couldn't afford um, the benefits they were asking for, the monetary benefits, and um, they gave that benefit. Um, so I, I, I think residency is, is terrific. I was a big fan of it. I vigorously enforced it. Um, and I think the hope is 10 years, after 10 years, your kids are in school and hopefully you stay, you don't move out after 10 years. But right now for the city of Boston, it's 10 years. Hi, thank you so much for your leadership being you know, and putting this panel together. I'm Alicia Stewart. I'm a Neiman Fellow, um, so not a law school student, but I have a lot of questions. Um, I'm really curious, it strikes me, and this is just to build on the previous question a bit, everyone's kind of approached this from a kind of uh, multidisciplinary, if you will, kind of approach, you know, whether that's community, whether that's policing, you know, whether that's, you know, from an independent um, look at, you know, the various police that are kind of in bed with prosecutors, understandably, to move things forward. I'm really curious to hear what are the, beyond community policing, which we've heard a lot about, what are the districts or local policing efforts that are successful, that one would deem successful from a racial, you know, equitable, like, and, and effective in terms of actually um, solving crimes and policing the community that you've seen in your various research, um, that you've seen across the pond, perhaps. Obviously, it's a different system, um, more top down. Um, I'm really curious to hear what those solutions that you've seen are that's worked well in America um, in this recent era. You know, when you talk community policing, um, my, my definition of that is a comprehensive approach to policing, okay? That's prevention, intervention, and enforcement, and partners in all of those areas. Prevention. I mean, as, as commissioner, I used to say, you know, the best crime prevention tool is a good education for these kids, okay, so they don't turn to crime. So, but, but when we were doing community policing, I think we were doing it pretty well, um, we had grants with community groups where we give them, say, $10,000. It wasn't a lot of money, but to partner with us on youth-related issues. Now, when we started in some of our difficult districts where we had the most problems, we had two nonprofits that were willing uh, to work with us. I think when I ended there, I had 24 nonprofits in, the, in those areas. Then it, our gang unit, they really got to know kids on a personal basis. They said, we need to get these kids jobs. Mayor hires gang kids, puts them to work during the summer, keeps them busy. Every year the mayor get hires thousands of kids to put them busy, get them jobs. <laughs> we worked with John Hancock to get, get kids internships at, at John Hancock. But that whole sense of this other, we're not gonna rest our way out of this problem. Yeah. But it becomes a question of, okay, we've got a problem. You sit down with all your partners, the clergy, community groups, um, street workers, and you start saying, okay, What's the approach? And it's not always an enforcement approach. Um, it's a comprehensive approach. I mean, you look right now, I mean, that's been Boston's model for an awful long time. But Bill Bratton, when he first went into New York, did the enforcement piece. Now he's gone back and he's committed to the community policing piece. And, and I think, again, when you have these issues, uh, community policing it is the, everybody's in it together. I mean, sometimes I say, that when the police say, okay, what are our priorities? reducing crime. Well, the community may have all kinds of different priorities, and they may be very small things, but the police have to pay attention to those. For instance, when I was commissioner, I let each police district do their own strategic planning, sit down with the community, decide what's important in those communities, okay? There was one community, Jamaica Plain, loud boom boxes were a real issue for that community. So we started, you know, going around enforcing the noise ordinance. Well, you know, that was something that was never on our radar screen, but out in that community, that was, and we had to listen to those people, okay? And we, we measured fear of crime. What was driving fear? Pay attention to those issues. And it's not always, you know, robberies and, and, and those types of things. It's other things that drive fear. So being in tune with the community, listening to, to the community and being responsive. Can I ask the panel to, to address two things that I've heard that have been effective in the past? I mean, one is the 10-point coalition. The commissioner uh, mentions clergy. I'd like to hear, w did that work? Why has it not been working more recently? And secondly, more controversially, women as police officers. Um, research shows that women de-escalate uh, when they're on the force rather than escalate uh, confrontations. Is that true? Should there be more women 
We're police officers. Let me answer both questions. Uh, women make, make a big difference. Uh, Washington, New York, uh, Boston, uh, Chicago, Cleveland, because uh, they know how to, uh, in a sense, stop the violence. Uh, and they're, the, pulling a gun is the last thing, you know, to have a conversation, talk to somebody. And I, I think you're getting more women involved, I think that makes a big difference. The, the second part is uh, a little bit more complicated when you think about the clergy. I was very impressed with what the clergy did. I was here as a uh, young uh, faculty member when uh, the Ten Point Coalition had this idea, we're going to go out and meet the kids who were in gangs. Uh, when they're preteens and teenagers, uh, and we're going to take them out and have a meal, have a conversation. But going out at 11 o'clock at night uh, on weeknights and weekends, and being with them until 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning, and that made an enormous amount of difference. And, and the commission will tell you the crime dropped dramatically. Uh, and but those things are expensive, right? And you got to figure out you know, where we're going to get the ministers, where we're going to get the uh, the youth supporters, people like that. That's going to make a, an enormous amount. A difference and that hasn't happened and we have to think about it too you rarely see police officers arresting anybody at a place like harvard university or spelman or morehouse or you can you name the college around the country it just doesn't happen right and and the same things are happening people are drinking uh, people have weapons uh, people are assaulting other people but the police don't get involved in the campuses and we need to it needs to have a conversation. Why are we doing that? I had a great talk with President Faust, and her point is that the problem is not just guns and gangs, it's alcohol. Uh, every weekend, I hope it's only weekends, <laughs> folks are, uh, you know, all the beer, all the wine, all the alcohol, people are uh, absorbing it, and a lot of things happen because of that. And we need to figure out how to make that happen. To, so that folks aren't involved in, in some serious way. I, I think the other thing, the police officers who are here are very much understanding the students and, and are friendly with the students, get a chance to know the students. And I think that more people need to, everybody needs to visit the police department. Everybody needs to go to the police ride along. Everybody needs to understand the challenges they have. Everybody needs to make sure that their church are involved in one respect or another with law enforcement. Uh, when things aren't working, when things are working, uh, because you know we have problems, but we need to figure out ways to solve them. Just to your to your question, Alicia, kind of combining two of the things that the commissioner and Professor Ogletree said that I've seen anecdotally, at least, uh, is encouraging are these um, sometimes called last chance interventions or something where the police community um, ident does all of the investigation you would expect if there was about to be a big takedown of key actors who are thought to be. Um, centrally involved in, in crime in a community. And then everyone's brought to a community center instead of a jail. And you, you read these reports where the police ch chief walks in with just a cart of all the evidence they have against them and says, you guys are going to go to jail. We have an open and shut case. This is your last chance. We are here as a community. And, and you, you, it's not just the police who are in this room. It's the clergy. It's the mothers, the parents, the school. They come in and they say, you will go to jail because this is the evidence that we have against you. Uh, but this is your last chance. We want to give you this mentoring. We want to give you an opportunity. Uh, and we are all here to support you through that. We're all committed to that. Um, and some of the, I, North Carolina has done some of this. There have been jurisdictions where they've tried this in a very targeted way. And uh, I, I think the, the initial sort of reports on it seem very encouraging that, that, it, that it's produced some good results. Um, and that's a way to have the police involved in that and everybody involved as stakeholders uh, and to make it really at this kind of, you know, do or, do or don't moment for, for the people involved. Thank you. I just want to ask a question that ties together a little Say bit. Say your more. name again. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Rena Kripa Johnson. I'm a 2L. Um, Professor Sullivan said kind of this idea that colors become a proxy for criminality. And I liked what Professor Crespo was saying, at least about ex ante kind of solutions, because when we were talking about accountability, especially in like the case of deadly force, it's often too late. Um, but I, I kind of visualize a lot of the tension in what's happening in the Black Lives Matter <coughs> movement with this idea that police um, have dangerous jobs and they need to be empowered to keep themselves and the community safe. But also kind of, we're now hearing the voices of people saying like, it can't be right that just the fact that you feel afraid of me 
is enough to justify your, you pulling me over, you frisking me on the side of the street, or in the worst case scenarios, like being shot, you know, the Amadou Diallo, the Tamir Rice. So given that kind of we now have a body of social sciences that can test bias, like we can really, have, people can answer questions and we can start to see what types of bias they have against different groups, um, why aren't we testing police on their biases and perhaps maybe making a space for evaluating whether people that have extraordinarily high biases on certain communities should be allowed to police those communities? They actually are in Boston. Uh, they actually are in Boston. There's a, a new police chief now. Um, I'm not sure if they're testing, but they, they are training on implicit bias and, and encouraging uh, officers to expose uh, and come to terms with the fact that uh, uh, each of us walk around with priors, right? I've got four or five right behind me as I'm sitting here. We all, we all have these priors that we bring with us and to recognize them and then, you know, the notion is that, that uh, behavior uh, would, be, uh, would, would be changed. Uh, so uh, I think it's a great idea and more departments should very aggressively do that. But just, just to kind of ask a question to you and Commissioner Evans, given that we do actually have a way to kind of test like a metric, do you think there's a space for really using that to evaluate which cops should police where, beyond training, but really just testing and then using that data to control the way we police. Question. Commissioner? Again, a lot of, when, you, when you're about to hire an, an officer, he goes through a large series of, of psychological exams and testing and what have you, and hopefully you weed them out then, and as I say, during probation, as, as far as, again, you get down to, the, they, they have unions, they have protections, and they're difficult. But if you start seeing officers that are exhibiting some problems like that, you either discipline them or get them out of there. Um, you get them to another police district, you take them off, off the streets. Um, you, you know, there, there's a lot of things, you know, sometimes, you know, I've talked about us versus them, police versus community. There's a lot of internal struggles, particularly in big city police departments between police management and the rank and file police as to what you can do and what you can't do. So, you know, there's an awful lot of things we'd like to be able to do, but, you know, that's violation of contracts and, and what have you. So, you know, in, in, it's, yeah, we, we used to do testing. I think we worked with, um, I forget the name of the organization, but it had to do with the Holocaust in bias, and, and we trained all our officers with that when I was the commissioner as to, you know, where does bias take us and, and that type of training. Absolutely critical to that, and every officer went through that. Uh, but the ability, you can transfer people, can you discipline them? Yeah, I, I mean, and we do that. If we find an officer a place where he, you know, he's causing more harm than good, then we get him out of there. Or I shouldn't say we, but when I was there, I did. Sounds like civil service reform should be on the agenda. Uh, I know that the Harvard police uses um, work with Mazarin Benaji uh, and her work on implicit bias, and uh, I think it's an interesting proposal to think about actually using it for placing people. Um, it, it, it is uh, interesting. The commissioner was a Marine, and maybe you'll appreciate this. Some of the most uh, effective uh, efforts have been in the military, where the uh, patrol leader, the, co the commander who's closest to the ground, is held responsible for creating a uh, racially uh, not biased environment. And so I think one of the things is where do you put the responsibility, not just on the individual who may be misconduct, having misconduct, but the person who's supervising them, and that they should be responsible for creating the, the training and the oversight and the accountability and the atmosphere. Um, I think we have time for one more. My name is Chris Mignani, I'm a third year law student, and I wanted to ask uh, the whole panel, I guess, about uh, Professor Syker and you know, the suggestion that I've heard before about having independent prosecutors rather than local people with conflicts of interest. And I just wondered about the idea of a state level prosecutor. It seems to me that a lot of these urban communities are in states that look very different than those communities. And that it might be politically even more difficult for a state appointed official or elected official to prosecute a police officer. And I just, I mean, I think about like with Amadou Diallo was indicted in the Bronx by a local Bronx prosecutor, Bronx grand jury, but all the shooters were acquitted in the state of New York. And I just, 
like I, I understand that there's a concern about conflict of interest, but my concern would be about taking it away from the community when it seems like the communities are already not represented. And then my, my, my second concern about it is also, it's sort of akin to the concern that some people on this panel have sort of voiced about the Title IX thing, is that if, if you create a prosecutor that's job it is only to prosecute police officers, will that prosecutor feel like it's their job to in, you know, convict police officers? And, and will it make it harder for them to be fair in ways that some people have thought that appointing someone to be a Title IX um, sexual assault adjudicator will make them unfair and they'll be then they'll prejudge cases to think that their job is to find people guilty who would like to take this? Yeah, no, you, you certainly raise good points and I'm sure it depends on the demographics of the state how much your first concern I mean the, the main concern is just that there be an independent prosecutor and that that independence could be achieved just by going to a prosecutorial unit outside of the one that works with the local police officer doesn't have to be a statewide unit. That's one possible proposal because there is a prosecutorial, a statewide prosecutorial uh, system that could step in. Um, and, you know, I think you want to assure independence from whatever kind of bias there would be. And so, you know, you're right, you might swap one kind of bias for another, but I think the key is to look for independence along, you know, whatever dimensions you can. And it's obviously context specific in terms of enforcing uh, those laws. But I think there are obvious conflicts of interest in having local prosecutors prosecute the local police with whom they work. And there are any number of possible solutions to that uh, that would solve that particular problem. You know, if I mean, you know, a life's a life. And there should be as an awful lot of oversight as to how it happens right now. Uh, I mean, I think the Suffolk County DA just released his findings on a deadly force case probably 15 months after it happened, okay? And then you'll have prosecutors in other parts of the state who will release their findings within two or three weeks. Um, it, it, it depends on where you are. I mean, I was in, in, in circumstances where, you know, it, it, the bottom line is the state district attorney comes out and right away they go to the feds. For a while there, both the district attorney, the attorney general, and the U.S. attorney were all overseeing and looking at deadly force. But, you know, there's got to be a better way to do it. So there's somewhat, a life is a life. There should be the utmost emphasis on those type of investigations. And, you know, if it takes a while to investigate them and you ensure the integrity and transparency of that because the community <coughs> deserves that. But right now, I'm not sure uh, the system works the way it should and that's probably not just Massachusetts, it's, it's, it's everywhere. Um, you, you know, again, it's the time it takes to investigate, what have you, where it's happening, what is the culture there, that type of stuff has a lot to do with the type of investigation. We're going to have to end. I'm going to ask three questions. One is, how many people think we should have another panel soon? Okay, we will do that. Uh, a second is, will the panelists stay a little bit longer to talk with people who didn't get a chance to ask their questions? Yes, they will. And the third is, <laughs> and the third is, will everybody join me in thanking both the people who ask questions and the panel?